Hey, John, check this out. The following podcast is part of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed may not represent other podcasts or affiliates of Gunna Geek. Check out more podcasts at GunnaGeek.com. And now get ready, because geekness starts in three, two, one. What do you think of that? I, I thought it was pretty good. Wait, was that, did we do it? Did we do it? Was that the start? That was the st- I think, yeah. I, did we just start I think, it? I, well, yeah, because there was a countdown. It said three, in three, two, one. We're part of a network. Yeah. That's right, listener. The WWE Network. Uh, of wrestling podcasts. Of wrestling pod. Yes. What have I gotten myself? Welcome to Unqualified Gamers, the video game wrestling network podcast. It was nothing I ever wanted and more. this Reese's peanut butter cup while you talk about the network we're a part of now uh listener Cody had posted this in um eat louder uh Cody had posted this in louder he had can you really not hear it that well I can't hear it that well I'm disappointed I'm unwrapping the Reese's peanut butter cups are my favorite of the of the cupped foods you hear this crinkling yeah how long does it take you to open a fucking Reese's peanut butter cup? I I opened it. I just I, you were. I'm crinkling it for you. It takes a really long time. Um, my crinkled hands. Of again, of the cupped foods, it is my favorite. Mm-hmm. So, uh, listener, if you if you hadn't seen us or like if you don't follow us on Google Plus or you don't check out our website, one shame on you. You should do both of those things too. Seriously, what are you doing, listener? You know you you don't need to admonish them that hard. Oh, okay. they're here for they're here for us. That was a little much. Was a little, you came on a little Stop. strong. Um, Isn't it gross to hear people talk with their mouth full? Yeah, it it has been every time you've done it for the past fifty four episodes. It's been gross. Yes, it's the fifty fifth episode. That's what, I know, and so now we're on fifty five. That's exactly right. But for the fifty four episodes before this, when you've started the show by talking with your mouth full, it's been gross mm-hmm. every time. So, listener, uh, if you. If you didn't know, we have joined a network of podcasts. Uh, it's called the Gunna Geek Network. You probably heard the bumper at the start of the show. And it is a network of geeky stuff. So I think our podcast is, uh, I'm assuming, going to fulfill kind of a video game niche. I think that's what we do. I, yeah. I don't know. You could. It's debatable, I guess, if you listen to the starts of our show. And they were required by law to have at least one host who's an alcoholic, and you actually fill that role twice over. So congratulations. That's right. I'm drinking enough for the both of us. Put down your whiskey now and uh, do a podcast with me for once. No. So yeah, so we're part of a network now, and, and what we're really hoping is that it gives us uh, kind of a larger audience that we can that we can touch with our uh, soulful voices and our uh, interesting, well, my interesting thoughts, and whatever Cody has. Um, and it should be fun. Words? I use words sometimes. So check out, also check out, because you can find us there now. You can go to gunageek.com. Um, and not only can you find us, but you can find a host of other kind of really great content about all things geeky. You know, there's a lot of other stuff in the geek culture aside from video games. Obviously, to us, it is the most important. But if you're a comic book fan, board game fan, pretty much anything, right? Yeah, there's some specialized stuff. There's a Doctor Who podcast, uh, which I believe may be newer to the network, although I really don't know. And um, I have to shout out and thank you to Chris and Naki of All Things Good and Nerdy, which is a podcast they do. I think that's kind of – and that's kind of Gunna Geek's flagship, right? Uh, no, Gunna Geek has its own podcast. Okay. So, um, But All Things Good and Nerdy, I believe, was one of the first ones because I, I know they have been with Gunna Geek for quite some time. But – um. But yeah, they uh, well I knew Naki from theater and then I had I had guest hosted on their show a couple times and then they were like, "Hey, do you want to uh maybe think about joining Gunna Geek?" and I was like, "Sure." So they exposed uh, us, they exposed you and me, John, to someone else. And of course, the person in charge of Gunna Geek was horrified as everyone is when they are when, when we expose ourselves to them. Uh, well, but decided doing the problem is the problem is you expose yourself by literally exposing yourself. See, and I, I still, still not sure where that other meaning comes in. But whatever. 
So we've been exposed now and now here we are. So thanks for them, uh, to them for that. And uh, that is another one of the podcasts. So yeah, go check it out and it'll be a lot of fun. And I, we may end up with some new, new fresh faces, some fresh guest hosts because uh, we, the, those within the network like to cross pollinate. That's generally what networks do. Did, did you watch the criticism of Machinima though? While we're on the topic of networks, I that seemed like a very odd segue. And no, I didn't. Well, no, it's it's very relevant to this conversation because it, at at very first, now I I knew I liked Gun and Geek. I thought it was a good deal. I, I was like, yeah, these these people are cool, but. Right before we got the official invitation, I watched a 20-minute YouTube video from a YouTuber who is part of Machinima or whatever, which has like 3,000 YouTube channels in its network. Does that sound about right? I think that might be an exaggeration. No, I'm, I'm, it literally has like several thousand. How, or maybe it's an exaggeration. How are you supposed to sift through that many channels? Well, that's the thing. The guy was complaining and talking about how basically Machinima just invites people to join the network and then all that does is give them revenue or something and they don't actually support anybody and they don't return your emails. And they, it was basically trashing Machinima. And I'm watching it and, I'm, and, and he's like, oh, but I can't leave because I'm under the contract and blah, blah, blah. And I'm watching it and I'm like, oh, crap, networks, they could be trouble. And within two emails of talking to the guy in charge of Gunna Geek, Steven, I was like, this is awesome. So that is not the case with these guys at all. There's This is a smaller network. There's maybe 10 or 15 podcasts. And I, I think I think they're choosing quality over quantity, which I think is really great. Yeah, and they also picked us. So you know, that was kind of nice of them. So I guess mostly quality plus us over quantity. But I did, I did actually, you know, this wasn't a blind, like, kind of jump into the wind, like, oh, someone wants us to be part of them. Let's do it automatically. No, it was like a, it was a, a, a you know, thought about, actually debated, uh, basically me with myself, because as you all know, listen, as you know, listener, John has nothing to do with any important decisions concerning really anything. I'm pretty much useless. I'm still trying to figure out why you are here, like what you do. It's still struggling. It's not much. Even in episode 55 of Unqualified Gamers. And might I say, John, I really, like, with every fiber of my being, hate multiples of 11. This is going to be this is gonna be a hard episode for you. No, I know that. No, that's the... It, it, we got to it, and I, I was naming the file, episode 55, and it was angering me. That's how much I mislike multiples of 11 beyond the number 11 which is fine because that's a prime number and for whatever reason it doesn't bother me as much but once you get multiples of 11 beyond 11 i am like just disturbed i don't really know what you're saying anymore listener to to go back a little bit on what cody just said um now that we have to provide you now that we have to provide you either quality or quantity this podcast is going to be seven and a half hours long because we yes. certainly cannot provide quality well, closer to seven hours after I filter out uh, 30 minutes of you. But beyond that, yes, it will be over seven hours. In all honesty, listener, we're super excited to be part of this network. Um, and hopefully it is a great relationship for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be nice because I've never been in a good relationship. hi Shot text, girlfriends. I don't even know. I'm, I'm going to edit that out. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. Ha ha! Hey, what'd you do this weekend that was in the real world? That Hey, listener, we're going to talk about video games eventually. Hold your horses. John, what did you do this weekend in real I life? Go, I just virtual high-fived you during that hey It was pretty good. Um, so it was a working weekend, so we did that. Um, we, I should say I did that. I, sometimes I speak for my wife and I at the same time. Um, so I did that. I worked all weekend. We did a little bit more setup on the nursery. And by we, I mean Casey went out. My, you know, my wife went out and bought a bunch of stuff for the nursery, um, and ha that's it's pretty much set up. I mean, we got like anywhere from you know the baby's scheduled in like six weeks, so oh god, I know. So, but we know nothing about babies, but I'm you know anywhere from like three to six weeks now is kind of the timeline here where we're going to be meeting our little guy. So, um, the the nursery is finally in like a state where it can be it can be lived in by a child 
we think, we hope. Um, and like there is the the one piece that I have in there because I was allowed a single piece in the nursery is a wall decoration. Um, it's it's I would say like a twelve by sixteen maybe canvas that's wood. It's a wood canvas thing that is a star from the original Super Mario Brothers. It's right. I couldn't remember what it was. That's done in black and white. So that is like officially in the room. And what's awesome is that that was the first thing we got as far as decorations go. <laughs> so, so Casey then uh, bought things that would match the star. No. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean other video game stuff, but it's stuff that that like you know kind of matches the star in terms of of decoration for the room. Uh, so it's all going to look really good when we actually like hang all the stuff and put it together. Um, so we did that. That was kind of like the big, I should say she did that. That was kind of the big other thing that was done. First, it was what you did. Then it was, first it was what we did. Then it was what I did. Then it's what she did. Like I literally cannot separate the two of you physically anymore. Well, I had input in that. I said, yes, that looks great. So I, I mean, I did that. I did my part, as husbands are wont to That's do. That's right. Um, and then otherwise, I was, I was working, and I, you know, dabbled in video games a little bit. It was good. Which, of course, we'll get into. Yeah, it was a good weekend. Excellent. Oh, and and did a little. Su- I actually did a little stuff for the podcast because, like, we actually had a, we had a, uh, a a piece of fan mail that I got to respond to for the first time, which was really cool. Um, so that was cool too. Yeah, that was really cool. And thank you again um, for sending that, listener. That was really cool. We love answering questions and hearing from you guys, like, really a lot. We've gotten a couple of comments now on our website, which is really cool, uh, unqualifiedgamers.com. And you can always email us at unqualifiedpodcast at gmail.com. And, of course, on Google+, Plus, we're still super active. And, in fact, shortly, shortly from now in this episode, we'll talk about what you, listener, were playing this weekend because a lot of people told us what they were playing this weekend. When we asked them. Yeah, this was probably the biggest response we've ever had for that. Yeah, it was... It was... Uh, it was, it was <clears throat> How do you feel about that? It was all of those things. Yeah. And more. Good. So, I had a good story from the weekend, and then it, uh... It, uh... Literally don't have it anymore. Well, you went to a party. I know you did that. I went to a... I went to a college party, so that was cool. I hung out with 20-year-olds... Because they are my maturity level. Well, is it? I mean, that can still be fun. It was fun. It was. Are you are you kidding? That was more fun than than adult parties. Because you know you because when you go to a college party with college kids, there's still that one or two people that just can't handle their alcohol or don't know yet how much their limit is, and they just get wrecked. And they limit. They limit break. They limit break. <laughs> Yes. Yes, they limit break with alcohol and they just get get really excited. And I so I brought a girl to this party and the ho- one of the hosts of the party who is one of the nicest guys like that I've talked to. Right? Like every time I see him he's very excited to see me and people and he's like, "Cody, hey." And like gives people hugs and stuff. He's he's a very kind kind person. And I'm I'm standing there, and this girl that I brought is like goes in the next room for something, and and he just walks right up to me, and he just goes, "Hey, Cody, I'm gonna f- your girlfriend." <laughs> and, I'm just like, and she and she hadn't met this guy. No. Oh, that worked out really well. That's fantastic. Well, she didn't hear it, but I just thought it was just really funny and random. And I was like, first of all, she's not my girlfriend. Second of all, that's not appropriate. In any way, and everybody around was, I mean, it was funny. It's not like I really cared, but, uh, however, another of his friends actually proposed a three-way to the girl that I brought to the party with him and his other friend. So, apparently college students are horny. Yeah, you were there once. Or they just like trolling, uh, girls that are with me. I I don't really know. You know, it could be both. It could, it could be both. But, uh... I do want to use what I did this weekend outside of the video game world as an opportunity to 
transition and segue into talking about video games because I meant to play video games Friday night and ended up not playing video games Friday night. But I did a video game related activity that we need to talk about. And I think you know what I'm talking about. I do, because actually I just realized that is one of the things that I did a, a lot this weekend. I did so much of it. Yeah, so I, I just had... Masturbation. Yeah, yeah, that was it. That was it. Video game related. <clears throat> actually, this this video game activity is kind of like masturbation in a lot of ways. Uh, I, I, have, I have a lot of new video games, right? I have Pokemon Y, I have Mario 3D World, I have uh, uh, Metal Gear Solid Revengeance, I have The Wonderful 101, right? All these ga- and I've got, of course, 100 Steam games, right? All these new games, most of which I haven't even played yet, right? Yep. Friday, I get home from work. Got home kind of late. It's like 7 o'clock, 7.30. Uh, grabbed a little snack because I wasn't real hungry, and I sat down, and I'm like, I'm going to play one of these games. And you... I think you ruined it, or I just decided I wanted to put something on the TV for a couple minutes while I ate. I think I actually, be- I think actually, you, this was the coolest part of the whole thing was that I texted you to let you know what was going on, and you were like, "I'm already watching it." That was, I think, that was later on. But anyway, what happened was I sat down and I turned on the Twitch TV stream for Awesome Games Done Quick 2014 which is a week-long speed-running video game marathon where they take donations for cancer research. And cancer and cancer prevention. Yes, cancer research and cancer prevention, which right. I want to I want to specify prevention because this is not like Susan G Komen, you know, like race for breast the cure. cancer awareness cuz being aware of it sure is going to do anything, right? Again, the views expressed uh, by me are not necessarily those of John or anybody else on the network. But this is like a real cause, like actual research and prevention, right? So um, over the course of the week, they raised over $1 million for cancer research. Which I believe was a record for this event. I think, was it? I'm not sure. I think it was. But first of all, that's amazing. To see gamers doing something good is amazing. But Friday night... I was watching these speedruns until something like 2 in the morning. I watched six, over six hours of people playing video games. And and some people grow up with siblings and they're used to watching people play games, right? Like, I think, John, you are even to a degree in this category because you watched your brother play some games, right? Oh, absolutely. And actually, he, yeah. watched, he watched me play a couple games, too. Sure, so you had that. I was the only gamer in my in my of my siblings. Like I, I have never watched any of my siblings play a video game ever. They they rarely even play them. So no, you are been, the one who games. I am the one who games, as you know. Hell, you watched me play games because I would have people over to my house and play one player games. Because in high school I was a <laughs> and kind of still am. But uh, I've never been a big gaming spectator. So for me to sit down for six freaking hours. Just drinking water mostly, and I wasn't even getting drunk or anything. And watching these speedruns is a testament to how insanely compelling they were. And you missed Friday, but what did you watch over the weekend, John? Well, the the real hit was Friday. I didn't miss all of Friday. Um, but the real the real draw was the Metroid Prime for me, which was what we both tuned into at the same time. True. And, and I, had already, I had already been watching when that came on. Right, and that was when I first texted you. I was like, hey, there's this Metroid Prime run on, but that's the run that was that was the highlight for me of the entire thing. I watched a couple of different games. Um, the one-handed Super Mario 64 was pretty impressive. What? Yeah, there was a one-handed Super Mario 64 where he beat the game in like 20 minutes with, four, what? with 14 stars. What? Which well, did I he think, have big hands? He had one hand. I don't know. Um <laughs> So, so that that was pretty entertaining too. And also, if you didn't see the blind Mike Tyson's punch out and the blind uh, super punch out, which were quite literally a blindfolded person beating the games, you should look those up uh, on their on their archives because those were wildly entertaining. Really? Yes. Um, 
But the highlight for me was the Metroid Prime run that we both kind of tuned into. Um, and the reason why it was a highlight was because they Skyped in a game designer for the game. Specifically, the guy that was in charge of designing... I want to say he was in charge of designing the cutscenes, some of the corridors. He had, like, like four like very specific things. Um, but... The the real key to why it was important was um, if you've ever listener if you have never watched a speedrun before, um, and I hadn't up until like last year. We actually have talked about speedruns on this podcast before during this event last year, um, and here we are talking about it again. But the way speedruns are typically set up is there is the person doing the speedrun, and then there are the people sitting next to the person doing the speedrun, and the person doing the speedrun has to, in general, has to be so intensely concentrated on the thing that he or she is doing that they can't really talk. They can't really narrate what they're doing. So other people that are next to them talk for them. For the most part. Yeah, and explain what they're doing. Um, So the, the cool thing about this Metroid Prime was they Skyped in this developer who talked over the speedrun along with the people that were narrating the speedrun, but he talked about just the development of the game and like what goes through the actual game design process. And to actually hear that firsthand for something that I love so much, video games, specifically for a video game that may be one of my favorite games, honestly, of like all time. I mean, Metroid Prime. Um, It was just awesome. And I was captivated and it lasted like it lasted like an hour and a half and i was with it the entire hour and a half yeah it was really interesting and i guess some other developers or designers had been skyping into a couple other game sessions so he wasn't the only developer the whole week that did it but it was the but first was, time i had seen it yeah i hadn't seen i didn't know any others either <clears throat> but yeah it was super interesting the way that he talked about it and in that particular speed run it was Mostly other people gaming. I felt a little bad because I thought that in particular the guy doing the Metroid Prime run was, I don't want to say socially awkward because that's mean, and he wasn't, but he wasn't ultra polite to the developer. I was just going to say he was a little disrespectful. I would say, yeah, I would, I mean, the developer was there and he was great and they were all like courteous enough, but he certainly didn't seem like thrilled that the developer was there. It, it was almost like he was unhappy. He was stealing his thunder a little bit. Um, and there were a couple points when he was like, yeah, this part's really badly designed or like um, the, the loading time for the Ridley room when you face Ridley in the game, apparently the load time is really bad. So the guy, the kind of quote unquote narrator, as John mentioned, sitting next to the speedrunner, was talking about how they get around the load times for the rooms. Because you know how Metroid works is you shoot a, a blue door and then it opens and you go through it. That's the whole series. Well, in Metroid Prime, that's the same way it works. But when you shoot those doors, it actually takes a couple seconds sometimes to open because it's loading the next room because it's a disc based game and it has to render and all that stuff. And uh, the guy, the narrator said something along the lines of, yeah, here's how we get around it. Although a couple times you can't, like the Ridley room has a really long load time. And the developer kind of laughed and he was kind of like, yeah, yeah, that one I can see or something like that. And the gamer, the actual guy playing was just like, yeah, the load time sucks. It's ridiculous. Or or said something otherwise just very kind of like unnecessary. (laughs) And the developer was was really good. He was a he was a very nice guy and very very like polite and and really interesting to listen to. But I, I kind of felt a little bad because the one guy playing it like made a couple like almost shots at the game, and I'm just like, who are you, really? It, I mean, if we had a develop if we had a designer for a Metroid game on our podcast, like it would be we, we would revere them. We, yeah, yes, we would. We would. Because they're the ones making the things that we love. And this is a guy who is an expert at speedrunning the game. So he has spent hundreds of hours on the same game. So you would think he'd be a little thankful or grateful. But what can you do? Now, that all being said, there were some just like just one other moment from this specific speedrun that we can go talk about other like the whole of the, the event as a whole and maybe some other speedruns we watched. But there's a there's a. A room in in Metroid Prime where there's like a it, it's a it's a 
randomly generated puzzle that you have to go through in a morph ball. I knew you were going to bring this up. I was just thinking the same. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, a randomly it's a randomly generated puzzle uh, that that generates when you're when you're going to get the super bomb. And it, I can't remember exactly what area of the game it is, but you you have to go through this this morph ball puzzle. And uh, the puzzle is basically a bunch of squares that you have to that you have to move through, and then there are some um, random water puddles that can short out different electrical barriers that there are. Basically, it's a maze. So you've it's got a randomly a... generated like six by six grid maze, right? Where the walls are differently placed every time, right? And now, when when you speed run something. Like they they are literally like caught up in frames of animation in a lot of these speed runs. I mean, the amount of detail that they go into to save time on stuff is incredible. So th- this guy gets to this maze, and like about five minutes before he gets to this maze, his like buddy on the couch starts setting up a laptop next to him, and I re- I remember watching him doing that. I was like, what the hell is he doing? So um, they start talking about the maze, and he's like, yeah, so um. The maze is actually randomly generated, and actually, the the developer started talking about it first because the developer was like, you know, one of the things that I like is I want some I I like randomness when I design games because I don't want it to be the same for the player every time, so they can't they have to actually like adapt to the situation. Um, and he said, but I bet for speedrunners that's really tough. And the guy and the guy speedrun the game was like, well, actually, I created a computer program to uh, figure out which maze I'm in with. So within the first, within the first like second of seeing the maze, I can typically figure out the exact maze that I'm in. So basically what it boiled boiled down to was there's an algorithm that the designer had made to make this maze. And the player of the game, the speedrunner, had gone and mapped out every single permutation of this algorithm of which there were, Roughly 300, according to the speedrunner. 500. It was 500. It was 500? Of which, was... There, were, of which there were roughly 500 yeah. permutations. And the speedrunner mapped out every single one of them and input them all into a self-made computer program to which he, like, what he, the way that it worked would, the way that it worked for him would, he would get to this map and he would input, like, the first three, the first, like, three boxes of the maze that had a single opening for a single opening on one side of the box. And that would narrow down the maze to him to one, two or three mazes. So he like had a sorting program inside this, this computer program he made. So he did that. He did that in, immediately when he got into this maze and he got through the maze in, in like four seconds or something like that. Yeah. Like it was, it was basically instantaneous and he probably spent, he probably spent hours at least, like mapping out every single one. It was just, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Um, that was the most ridiculous part of that speed run to me. Yeah, and there's some really cool, like, like when moments like that happen in the speed runs, you know, there's an audience that's watching them and actually in, it, I think it's taking place in a hotel, like, banquet thing. You know, there's an audience behind them in chairs. They all, like, everybody's cheering when stuff like that happens. Um, or when they, like, hit a specifically, or a specific, like, difficult glitch because another tacit of speedrunning is you have to exploit every glitch that is available to move through areas. Like there was a bunch of stuff that was skipped in Metroid in Metroid prime. So, um, but yeah, that particular moment was, was my favorite moment of all of the stuff that I watched. Yeah, I could see that. And I I know Metroid prime is one of your favorite games ever. Cause we've talked about that before. I, I enjoyed it. I, I'm not like a diehard Metroid Prime guy because I didn't love 2 or 3. So I'm watching it, and it was entertaining, and it was it was interesting to hear the designer, obviously. But I stuck around for after that, and the speedrun after that was, from what I saw live, probably my favorite event of the whole thing. And listen, we're telling you about all this because you can YouTube most of this. Just look for uh, a. G D Q 2014 search for that or the hashtag awesome games done quick. You can find most of this on YouTube, but it was one or two in the morning. It was late. It was after midnight on Friday night and they had four of the top super Metroid speedrunners in the world compete in a live competition for a super Metroid speedrun. 
So on Twitch TV, they split. Well, I'm literally, I'm literally getting goosebumps as I tell this story. I'm not even kidding. That just happened. Wow. So th- at Twitch TV, they split screen it. So in each four corner of the screen, you could see one of the speedrunners, and they're all playing Super Metroid. And the first t- five minutes of the game, it was like watching four of the same screen. Just the absolute. Precision. Flawless, this, yeah, the synchronization, the the sheer like perfection of their movements was awe inspiring. It was ridiculous, and it was funny because, like you said, you were talking about the crowd. Uh, they were they were describing the crowd because they had two kind of announcers announcing the whole thing, which was really cool and really interesting. And they were saying during it, they were like, "This room is packed. It is standing room only. People are standing against the walls. Like people are sitting on the floor." And you could tell. I mean, the there was the room was it was just people. It was like them and a wall of people behind them, right? So because in the middle of the of the four way split, they also had overlays of the actual room. So the place is jammed, and you would see one of the runners literally just miss a jump. He would like fail to land on a platform. And and have to rejump, and there would be like an audible gasp from the crowd. They would just be like, ah, oh, like that kind of a thing from the whole crowd every single time. And there were a couple, uh, a couple shines is one I what I want to call it. Do you know what those are? Shines in Super Metroid. So when you're using the speed boost, you use the speed boost, and then you're running with it, and then you crouch down, and it kind of stores all this kinetic energy in your character in Samus. And then you can, like, dive forward or dive up. It's like the super jumps forward or sideways. And apparently they're called Shine shine Sparks. Shine Sparks, I guess, is the name for them. Uh, And there were several Shine Sparks where it was like they had to use a Shine Spark to basically, like, like, propel themselves horizontally through two or three screens to save, you know, a second or three seconds of time or whatever. And... To, when when somebody when they hit the first like kind of area where everyone needed a shine spark, every time someone successfully shine sparked, the whole the crowd erupted. And like if there was a perfect one and they cleared the whole room, they were just like yeah yeah and all these cheers. And then like the third or fourth runner missed it and hit a, a pillar halfway through the screen instead of making it all the way through, and the whole crowd was just like oh oh, and they were so into it. I was I was absolutely immersed i have never been so immersed in watching a video game like i was more i was more in i tweeted this i was more invested in that super metroid speed run race than i have been at most athletic events like watching the nfl or or even like the blackhawks play hockey like i've never been that invested sure because it was it was just so close and i posted a couple photos on google plus but they were like it was it was either a th- I think it was a 31 minute run. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean it's this is they're really good at this, right? So, it was a I think it was a 31 minute run. Uh at the end, one of the speedrunners actually died. And they talked about how Super Metroid is one of the most volatile speedrunning games because you die in it. It's it's not just a matter of like get through it as fast as you can. It's a matter of get through it as fast as you can and alive. And when they were twenty one or twenty two minutes into it, I put a picture of this on Google Plus. Two of the speedrunners were on the same screen, like screen for screen, just side by side. They were literally in the same place. Twenty some minutes into the run, which is again how insane their their precision was. Uh, and then it got to the end, and it was just. The very end was the climax of the thing. So, Sean, you're familiar with Super Metroid. You know when the when the giant baby Metroid, uh, when you see it for the first time in Torian, yes, like it. You see, you see all these stat, all these uh, Chozo or not Chozo. You see all these space pirates that have been turned to sand, and then you encounter a space pirate, and suddenly your giant baby Metroid grabs onto that space pirate. You see that that's the thing turning things into sand, and then it it grabs you, drains you of all your energy, realizes you're its mom, kind of, and then flies away. There is a way to skip the animation where it does that, which saves you, like, 10 seconds, or, like, 15 seconds, like, an insane amount for speedrunner standards, right? 
So what you have to do is you have to jump a certain way so that the Metroid circles around you but never actually gets you. And if you do it for like three or four rotations and shoot the walls enough, you can get through the walls and skip that whole cinematic. Well, the first two runners both got caught by the Metroid, but they were way ahead of the third guy. Well, what does the third guy do? The third guy gets past the Metroid and the crowd went insane. It went insane. These two guys were fighting Mother Brain and the third guy suddenly skips the Metroid, which puts him like a screen away from Mother Brain. Uh, the guy still lost by like 10 or 15 seconds. I mean, he was pretty far behind. But honestly, the two that finished, finished within, I think, a second and a half of each other. It, it was just that close. And wow. all three finished with 31 minutes uh, for the official the official finish time for the play. So it just, just, if you can watch the Super Metroid race, it's only about a half hour. And my God, the energy in there and it's, it's so out of control. Totally out of control. And it, it, you know, the nice thing was for me, John, like, I, I don't know Metroid Prime that well, but Super Metroid, we, you and I both know Super Metroid. Oh, yeah, and it's been a long time since I've played it. Sure, and me too, but we're much more familiar, like, I'm much more familiar with that, and watching the speedruns of something that you're really familiar with is obviously much more entertaining than something you've never seen before. Oh, it absolutely is. So, so that happened. So that was my, my highlight was yeah, there... I had a similar. I mean, I had a similar game that I watched. The high, my highlight was still the Metroid Prime one, but um, I watched a side by side race of Mirror's Edge, which, if you if you've ever heard of this game, it's a it's a first person basically parkour game. Um, and there's kind of there's not another good way to describe it. It's like a first person parkour, and the whole the whole object of the game is to traverse the environment and to do it quickly. Um, and so it is kind of perfect for for speed runs because the whole point of it is to go as fast as possible to move oh. as fast as possible. Yeah. Um. So it just it it was really fun to watch two people race, and the the reason why it that game was really cool to watch was because there wasn't a single fastest path through the levels. So like the the runners would like split off into different paths, but typically converge roughly at the same time on the levels. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So it was really, that, that was really fun to watch too. Um, but overall it was, it was super cool, super cool that it was benefiting charity. I mean, I think that that's really neat. Um, and these people, I mean, this just shows the kind of the versatility of this particular hobby, right? Because I bet these people don't like even play other games. Like, I don't think you could in some of these instances. Oh no, you can't. There's no way. So I mean they are they are like quite literally playing you know the same game over and over and over and over again with all of these other games coming out and that is like where they are deriving their enjoyment of video games. It's it's something I mean it's it's athletic. It's it's honestly athletic. I mean having the muscle memory and the precision to do that is is I I saw a comment on Kotaku which is the asshole of the internet in terms of commenting I think and uh they they posted a link to I think it was the blind punch out right or or another similar speed run and some idiot in the comments section said something like oh yeah well it's just feeding their addiction or their their OCD good to see like gamers are able to benefit from having OCD and being totally obsessive about this stuff and whatever and and it just aside from the fact that the guy's an idiot and clearly doesn't know what he's talking about and doesn't see how cool this is. I started thinking about it and I was like, this really is not a whole lot different from athletes like practicing and working out and dancers, figure skaters, rehearsing things and things like that. Like it's really similar if you think about it because it's about repetition, right? I mean, sprinters run a lot in straight lines. Yeah, that's very true. (laughs) You know, these guys are the gold and I watched, um, a golden I run I'll talk about in a second but the the guy was talking about how a lot of games people will will speed run the whole game over and over and over but golden I has is one of the oldest speed running communities and the people within golden I will play the same level hundreds of times eight or you know seven or eight or nine hundred times to get the level down on just a specific like specific level and that that is it's it's like a sport it's like bowling. That's what you used to do. You used to bowl every week and work on your precision, right? Well, I still do. 
<laughs> and you still well, and you still do. But when you did it competitively, I mean, that was that was what you were training. You were training to be a better bowler. Yes, and bowling's a bowling's a decent example because it it is all in the attempt of doing the same thing every time. Yeah. So. So yeah. So I I just. I think, I mean, I think speedrunning should be an esport because it's like you see this in these guys. They, they, when you see someone do something flawlessly, like just flawlessly, that that is impressive, no matter what lens you look at it from. In my opinion. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I mean, you sit down and watch some of these speedruns, listener. It's and you're just like, you you know, you will never be able to do that ever. You will never do it. So that's how I feel. Um, were there any other cool highlight speedruns you want to mention? Those were the main ones for me. There was a there was one that you didn't get to watch that I did, uh, which was the Chrono Trigger 100 percent run that they I did. I hate you so much for and missing that. By the they, way, they did it in in like roughly five and a half hours, and I didn't get to watch the whole thing because it was it was uh, nine o'clock at night when when it started. Um, <laughs> So and I had to work the next day, but I didn't get to watch a, a large portion of it. And it's the impressive part of of an RPG when they do a speed run like they do, is that they they basically skip all of the random battles and still find a way because you have to fight bosses in in traditional old JRPGs. So they they skip all of the random battles, so their characters are dramatically under leveled, and they yeah. still they still have methods with which to beat bosses. So that's really fun to watch. Uh, so I was I was pretty invested in that, and and keep in mind, Chrono Trigger is one of my favorite games of all time. Um, as stereotypical and boring as that is, it really is. <laughs> it's so, one of the best games of all time. Yes. I mean... So I, uh, I you know I was very invested in that speedrun because of how invested I I am and was in that game. Yeah, I would have been really invested too. I was pissed. I was mad that I had places to be. Well, I had to go to a college party where people were uh, making sexual advances towards the girl that I brought to the party. They also they also did a um, a speed run directly before that of a fastest run um, where where you go with Marl into the into the portal on a new game plus, you know, and it's just oh. you and Marl and you kill yeah and you kill. Um, Lavos, and they did it in four minutes. So they went from start to finish of the game in four minutes. But that that's not as impressive because you could do that if you grinded enough. I don't think I could because she did this weird skip where she like you know how Marl stands there and like gets candy. Y- yes, she skips that. Like there's this weird skip that she did. Wait, gets candy? Yeah, you know, like when you're waiting to get to to get into Luca's event where she's showing off her transporter. Oh, weird. Yeah, I don't remember that. I don't remember the candy part. I remember you can steal someone's lunch, you can find someone's cat. Yeah, she stops for candy. Oh, okay. I believe you. I, I have. It's been quite a while since I played the game. Though, granted, I've played it probably as many times as you, almost. Which is a lot. <laughs> but it's been a while. Speaking of games that aged, though... Well, did you have anything else to say about that run? No, I think I think that pretty much covers... like the the stuff that i watched and liked the most from the from the speed running stuff yeah oh i, oh, I was going to say it from the rpg world i think they did final fantasy 4 in two and a half hours yeah and they do that they do that in a way that actually is uninteresting to me oh you don't like the way cuz i we actually talked i actually described vaguely how they do that in an earlier podcast. I did that like 10 or 15 episodes ago. Yeah, basically they just end the game with a really weird party makeup by doing some crazy skip ahead glitch listener. And for me, it's like a little, I don't know. It's its weird, but it just there's something unfulfilling about it for me. So I have also talked early, before on this podcast about the Ocarina of Time 20 minute speed run that you can do by going into the Deku tree and using a, an exploit with the bug in a bottle to teleport to after you've killed Ganon? Do you, would that also not interest you? No, that sounds pretty interesting. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I think I, I, I'm sure I sent you the video, but I'll send it again. But yeah, it's 20 minutes. And that 20 minutes, they are still insanely really good, but they skip from the Deku tree to Ganon. So quite a bit skipped there. I actually watched an Ocarina of Time race. Uh, it was a, an all temples race where they just had to 
beat all the temples. And it was interesting. They talked about a lot of stuff. It wasn't the best, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting. But yeah, the Final Fantasy IV in two and a half hours, yeah, they get to the you get to the Dwarven Castle underground. There's a bizarre glitch where you enter and exit a staircase 50 times, and then you appear at Zeromus, and you pretty much end the game there. So it's stupid. Yeah, it's said. it's really weird. I Yeah. Well, to me, uh, for me, rather, the other thing that I watched, the one other speedrun I watched after the fact, actually, this is on YouTube for sure, was the two-controller GoldenEye 64 speedrun. Did you hear about this? I thought it was one controller, two different people. Uh there is it was two controllers two people so the the golden eye controller settings by default in the game they have an option to let you play one person play with two controllers i don't oh. know if you knew that i uh, no yeah yeah it's a it's a default in the original game i think it was probably just kind of shoehorned in so people could play multiplayer but you can play it so one person is moving and the other person's aiming and shooting oh i had no idea yeah, yeah, it's a control scheme by default. I mean, like, when would you or I have ever used that, right? Right. So, of course, we don't know. What, like, But I, I remember seeing that in the controller options, like, when I had the game. Because I had to get rid of the game because of Columbine. So Really? There's a fun fact for the listener. Yeah, because <laughs> after Columbine, my mom was convinced I would go on a mass murdering spree. And I had to trade in GoldenEye for Smash Brothers, which ended up being a really good thing because that became my favorite series pretty much ever. Um, but I no longer old, go, own GoldenEye as a result. I don't have GoldenEye 64 anymore. So <laughs> what can you do? Wow. But uh, <laughs> I watched the GoldenEye, and it, it ended up being a world record speedrun on two controllers. And you mentioned, I only bring it up because you mentioned the narrator. They usually have a narrator because the guy gaming isn't really doing much. Well, one of the guys, one of the guys doing the speed run was super quiet. I didn't hear him say a word the whole time. The other guy was like Vince Vaughn. Like his way of speaking, the way he looked, like I thought he was Vince. He was like a Vince Vaughn twin, like a Vince Vaughn clone. And he was talking the entire time just nonstop about everything. And he got really into it. Like he, you occasionally have to apparently in this two controller golden eye mode, kind of shout directions to the other person. Cause one person's moving. Right. So he would occasionally have to be like left up forward, you know, go right, go right, go left. Okay. He would do that. And then they would like nail something or he'd hit a switch really well. And he'd be like, yeah, baby, that's it. That's it. That's the one baby. Nice job. We got this. <laughs> Like, he kept doing, like, just like Vince Vaughn would sound like, though. Like, seriously. Uh, and he kept doing it um, through the end of the run. And then at the very end of the run, they exploit a trick that makes Trevelyan drop a grenade on himself and basically kill himself. Uh, they used some, apparently it's really tricky to do, but they pulled it off. And it became a world record for two controllers. But that run was entertaining to me just because he talks the whole time and explains, like, everything they're doing really well and talks about the golden eye speed running community as a whole. Um, and it was, it was just pretty fun. Kind of, kind of boring to actually watch the content though, because you move faster in golden eye if you're not looking forward. So you're, he, they're looking at the ground virtually the entire run, which means they have to know exactly where to go. <laughs> right. Which is insane. But it's kind of boring to watch because they're literally looking at the ground and you're just watching them move really fast. Right. And I think it was on agent mode because they they cleared the whole game in something like 21 minutes or something or like 24. It was in the 20s. The whole game. I think yeah, they did the I don't th think they – I mean I don't think that they uh, – when they're going for speed, I don't think there's usually a lot of restrictions in terms of difficulty level. Correct. I mean, you know, unless you're doing a specific like hard mode run, but yeah, right. it was, I mean, I think they've cleared the facility in like 40 seconds <laughs> wow. and the target time on double agent is a minute 20 and I've never gotten close to that. So even on agent, that's impressive. But so that was the other one It is golden eye. And on new year's Eve or on new year's day this year, I went with somebody to pick up her friend from a party where she had crashed. And when I got there, they were playing golden eye. And one of the guys was playing multiplayer, just two-person multiplayer in the caverns. And he was like, oh, pick up the controller, take, you know, play a couple lives or whatever while you're here. And I'm like, sure. That game is not aged well. Oh, it looks so bad. 
not just the way it looks, the play. I think maybe if I adjusted the control scheme so it was more similar to like a modern game like Halo or Call of Duty, maybe that would have helped. But the default control scheme is it is unplayable. I think it's probably because the controller is one of the worst controllers of any system what ever made. What is wrong with you in hating on the N64 controller? The Nintendo 64 controller is a bad controller. You're a bad controller. It's a bad controller. Nothing is wrong with the N64 controller. You look at controllers that exist now, and you go back and you tell me the Nintendo 64 controller is a good controller, and I tell you, you, sir, are delusional. It's you, sir, than- you, sir, are not looking at it with an objective eye it's better than the dreamcast controller i don't think i ever had a dreamcast controller i don't really remember what that one was like but it certainly could be i did and it was better and the 64 controller was not that bad it's pretty terrible well we all played a whole lot of games on it didn't we Look, it didn't stop me from absolutely loving that system. But you look back on that now, and the f***ing Super Nintendo controller was better than the Nintendo 64 controller. Hey, the Super Nintendo controller was good. That's what I just said. In fact, I said it was better than a Nintendo 64 controller. You know, the NES controller was not good. I had to ice my hands after playing Ninja Turtles 2 for two hours once. That's really weird. I, You probably should have stopped sooner. Yeah, well, maybe you should have stopped sooner. It's typically what we say about this podcast, too. Um, you know, we... Do we play games? Did we play games? I don't. You don't play games. You, you never play games. Did you play a game? I did. You know, I was actually all prepped and excited to talk about Super Mario, New Super Mario World, but we've gone so long already that, like, uh, I'm not going to talk about it. I will talk about a game that I was just putzing around with one morning, though. Um, I spent, like, four ish four hours ish with and it's a game that i uh i got off one of the steam sales as the games that i normally puts around with are and it was called state of decay have you heard of this no okay do you like zombie games because i don't yeah i don't either um (laughs) except the last of us which is my game of the year for 2013 right but you don't like zombie games no um so state of decay and I don't like zombie games either. And Wait, I pro- except, except for I made a game with zombies in it. That's, that's a pretty good game. It's a really good game. It's a, it's a pretty good game. <laughs> it's a good game. Um, so, I, you know, I, I promise, listener, I don't just randomly buy games on Steam that are cheap. I do, in fact, read descriptions to ensure that maybe it sounds interesting to me. So I looked at State of Decay, and the thing that, the thing that got me was it's a procedurally generated open world zombie game where like your like your set of survivors that you have and that you go out and find are different like kind of each time you you play and so the way the game works is like you start off and you're a character and i don't know if you're the same character every time um but there's like a really loose story like they were like my characters are out on like a camping trip and they came back um and when they came back the zombie infection had run rampant and started and so um they get back like into town and they they find a group of survivors that that are all holed up and that's where you kind of like set up your base and so you're set there and you have various resources uh that that like some of which are are ticking down so food for instance is ticking down and i don't know something else is too and then you've got a bunch of other resources that you all that you have um kind of control over like the number of cars that your settlement has um that's that's like a a one thing and like the amount of of gasoline for those cars is another thing obviously you're not going to be able to use any of the cars if you run out of gas um but the the thing the cool thing is that you have this home base and the home base is mobile so if you go out and you find like a larger building with more more or I should say like less uh, points of entry that you would rather have your home base set up in. You can like with enough money and their money is influence in this game with enough influence, you can kind of convince everybody to move the entire home base, like to that area. Well, each one of these home bases has a set number of like modules that you can use to build stuff. So the first thing I built was like a garden so we could uh, grow our own food and so food wouldn't be as big of an issue. But there's, you know, a multitude of other stuff that you can build. And then the very first one that you get to, 
um, there's like three different there's only there's only three open spots and you can build stuff and then you can actually upgrade the buildings the stuff that you make so you can like have a garden and then you could have uh, a better garden right that you that you upgrade later with with materials you find and the way you get materials is you go out on these self uh, self motivated uh, I guess resource runs so there's a bunch of places that have been abandoned because of the zombie attack and uh it's like you and you can hire somebody with influence to come out and go with you. Uh, but there's, you can like stealth move through stuff. If you want, you can drive a car up to stuff and just go in guns blazing type thing. Um, but you can go into these buildings and you can find these resources to bring back, to build stuff in your home base. And kind of, kind of the whole point is just to stay alive. There is, there are some procedurally generated quests that keep you, interested in an in like that way if you want like if you need a little more direction um if you need somebody to tell you hey my sister was lost up in this area of town like next to the grain silo can you go like check and see if she's there you know that gives you like an excuse to go out there and maybe explore that area um but that's kind of like the gist of the game sounds a little interesting right no Okay, the fact the the thing that interested me was the the creating your own home base stuff, um, and the open world nature of it. The problem with the game for me is that it's not fun to play at all. That's literally what I just said. For me, it doesn't sound good. Yeah, it's it's not fun to play. It's got a lot of really interesting ideas, but it's just not fun. And What's I don't the know name of the game? State of Decay. And I don't know if maybe I'm over just completely over zombies that I just can't do it anymore. Um, I kind of want to play Dead Rising 2, which I have, but have not played yet because it's more of a farcical take on the zombie genre. But I think for the most part, I'm just kind of over zombies. But, you know, the the only way that zombies can be threatening are, I, I guess there's a couple of ways, but they're all the same in every game. They can either be super surprising and like pop out of something when you get close to it and bite you, or they can overwhelm you with their sheer numbers. But if you're ever in a situation where it's you and one zombie and you've got a 2 by 4 in basically any zombie game that you play, you beat the zombie to death over the head with the 2 by 4 Well, that's the majority of this game. is like you beating zombies with a 2 by 4 And that's not fun. No. And there's guns, but they're, they don't like... Uh, they're like bullets are scarce so you don't want to use them which is good i like that that's kind of the way it should be in a zombie game but for the most part it's just like uh eh, it 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 they're not fun to use like they they don't you don't fire well um it's just not fun like the game's not fun and the it's one of those things where i do see some potential there like the the open world stuff the building your own base like the survival stuff of the game is interesting but it's it's clouded by this not fun sh- cloud that surrounds this game to play. So I can't recommend it. I don't think it's very good. It's not worth the $3 that I paid for it. Yeah, the thing to me is there's nothing cathartic about beating zombies because they're not a real thing anymore. Like, you know what would be really interesting? Yeah, I'm listening. So if they had a game where you had to beat up you had to like ransack like politicians' offices. Like you, you would go into like a crooked politician's office, just like break every piece of furniture, like power bomb him through a table, just like break his legs and stuff like that. And then for every time you do that, you influence a positive policy, like environmental protection laws and smoking bans being passed, and then you could shape the world that way. It would be like a legal simulator, but you'd get you'd get that cathartic feeling of just beating up corrupt bad guys that sounds like the worst game ever are you kidding sounds pretty dumb i will design it and it will be better than uh state of decay how's that you know it could be called any game where you are a member of the rebellion and you are working to overthrow the evil empire any one of those games could be the game you just no, described. No, no. I want a closer, a closer parallel to wrestling with the with to wrestling, right? And to the current uh, 
state of the WWE. No, I see uh, where you're going with this. You see where I'm going with for the with the current. I, I know you're trying to not get political. I see what you're doing here, but the, the current. I'm trying to not with, get wrestling. The current discontent with American po- politics. Just you know, I'm just saying. You certainly said it. It's a video game. It's a bad video game. Anyway, uh, I just started Metal Gear Solid Rising Revengeant. Metal Gear Solid Revenge. I just started <laughs> Metal Gear. I just started some Metal Gear game. You started that Platinum game. It's This is my first Platinum game. Oh, now, welcome. Not, so I'm not going to review it yet. Uh, and I also have Wonderful 101, which, again, the speedrunning marathon interrupted my plan to play it. So... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that this week. So once I've gotten a little more platinum under my belt, a little more platinum in my pants, I will go ahead and uh, and review that maybe next week. But I, if you're going to review Mario 3D World, then I should probably play that because I got that too. Yeah, we so, need to talk about that because that game is great. Yeah, I know. I, I beat World 1, so I'm, uh, I'm not far, but I like it so far. So we'll talk about that soon. But hey, listener, you're part of this podcast too. And what did you play this weekend? Uh, we asked you, and you said, uh, Nora said, not sure yet, I'm having some friends over, so maybe some Minecraft Hunger Games. I think that mine. I think that, so, the last I knew of Minecraft, before I, I did a tiny bit of research, and by tiny I mean I read like three posts on it, um, Minecraft was just this building simulator. But I guess that over the past few it could even be years, they've done a bunch of patches that have added a bunch of different, like, modes to play the game. Now, I don't know if Hunger Games is a mode, but I know that they have added a bunch of different modes now with which to play the game. Well, you and I are not allowed to play that game because that would make us too qualified. Yeah, I really know nothing about that game. But I hope that you had fun with that. Uh, Okay, so another listener said same, just survival, though. The listener's name is Veza Menalika. Veza Menalik. It looks Russian or I can't tell. It's V-E-Z-A-M-E-N-A-L-E-K-A. Or American. Could be American. Veza Menalika. I like it. it. It's a pretty looking name. Like it look, it's aesthetically pleasing with the V and the M and the L and the K. I'm not being facetious. It actually looks... Like, it looks like a pretty name, but I, I don't know how to do it justice, so I'm not going to try right anymore. On. Uh, Pepe says, I think I will play MK9, Injustice, and Battle Royal today and tomorrow. Saturday night and Monday, maybe Skyward Sword time. Skyward Sword, on amongst my list of top games of 2013, even though it came out in 2012. Mortal Kombat 9? Really? They're so on they're, 9? That must be the latest one. They cannot be on 9. I think they might be. There's no way. Well, there were could, like a bunch of Mortal Kombat's that we didn't play. Could there be an MK that stands for something that's not Mortal Kombat? I mean, Injustice and Battle Royal are are fighting games, so Mortal Kombat Nine would make sense. But how are how are they at nine? There was that really bad Sub Zero game that counts as one. So they had Mortal Kombat, Mortal Kombat Two, Mortal Kombat Three, and then nine. Yep. No, that's exactly the order that it went. It doesn't make sense. You're right. I don't know. I'm just... Okay. Uh, Jonathan also playing Minecraft and some Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds. Good choices. Uh, Jamie Butterworth is going to play some Last of Us, which is good because I sent him my copy. Uh, So I'm (laughs) glad you're enjoying that. Uh, He's the one that sent us Wonderful 101, by the way. So thank you again so much for that. John, I will try to finish it soon so I can send that to you. Or you could just send it to me. Yeah, do you have other do you have other games to play? I guess, I guess I do too. Maybe I'll just send it to you to play for. I don't know, but I well I want to play some of it, but then I'll send it to you and then if meta, so the thing is is you're currently playing a platinum game. I don't know if you're going to want to necessarily play another platinum game right away. Maybe you will. Maybe you will fall in love with this developer like I have cuz I I love platinum. I love what they do. So maybe you will too. But if you're not, if you do not fall in love with them, send it my way. We'll see what happens. We'll both play it sooner or later. Yeah, so, eventually. Uh, and he's also going to probably play Xenoblade if he finishes Last of Us. So there's that. Uh, Scott is going to play Battlefield 4 because this will be the last weekend I can go hard on my PS4. Got to send it back for repairs, sad face. What? What? Yeah, there was some talk of those those systems dying. What? Really? Yeah. I missed that. Well, then again, neither you nor I feel like spending the money for one, so that's... 
that's that. But well, I'm yet. sorry to hear that. Well, I hope you got a little Battlefield 4 time in there. Uh, our fan Christopher said Homework Project Edition and Robot Builder. I don't think those are real video games. They're not. He's working in a robot competition. He actually sent me a bunch of emails. Uh, or, well, he sent me an email with some links to learn more about this robotics competition. So, um, listener, if you've not seen those on our Google Plus page, then then I will be posting them soon because um, I'm interested in looking into it. I just had a very busy weekend. Uh with a lot of stuff, but um, continued success. Wish to you, Christopher, on your robot contest, and still think it's really cool that you're building robots. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, Justin is checking out the Bravely Default demo and some more Last of Us. Also, Rock Band Party Saturday Night because it's 2007. I'm kind of jealous, actually. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Rock Band holds up. It totally does. I busted it out like three weeks ago. Yeah, it holds up. Um, Bravely Default. That's the Square Enix game, right? Yep. Weren't you really excited about it? I am very excited about it. But you haven't played the demo? You know, I'm not big into demoing games. It's I it's kind of a thing where like I don't wanna like I don't wanna get tired of whatever it's doing before the actual game comes out. I don't know. It's probably dumb, it probably doesn't make sense, but it's not I don't like to demo games. Yeah, you don't seem like a big demoer to me. Our fan Miles is playing Batman Arkham Origins and some Skyrim. Can't wait to beat Harley Quinn's Revenge. There must be an add on, I'm guessing. It or must a- be side thing or a uh, arkham origins sounds good. I'm, I'm gonna get origins at some point just not yet i'm gonna wait till it tanks on steam and in, in terms of tanks and price because it eventually will yeah so there's that uh patrick is playing teso beta that is the elder scrolls online oh oh whoa, what yeah They're, that's a thing that's happening are you kidding me i'm so this unqualified. Is, this is I'm, why we are unqualified i'm so unqualified they're doing Elder Scrolls Online, really. Yeah, they really are. And in fact, right now the current the current the, the current thought for their pay structure is going to be sixty dollar game plus fifteen dollar uh plus fifteen dollar subscription fee plus possible in game purchases. It's like the worst of all three worlds. I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how you do that now in like today's day and age, but I think they're gonna go for it. By being Elder Scrolls? I guess so. Full disclosure, I've never played an Elder Scrolls game. Yeah, they're a little intimidating. Yeah, especially Skyrim. My goodness. It's a but scope I, thing, isn't it? It is a scope thing. It's it's yeah. too... Well, here I bought Skyrim for my old roommate, um, and I saw him play it a bunch of times, and every time I walked by him playing it, he was one-hit killing dragons. And I'm just, that didn't seem fun to me. Like, I feel like... There's a slight difficulty curve for the first, like, 10 hours of the game, and then after that, you just destroy everything. You're like a god. That's the distinct impression I got from both of his run-throughs of the game, and that just doesn't interest me. It's because you're, you're a p*** that wants to save the dragons. So, uh, Brandon is playing The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker HD, and A Link Between Worlds. Good choices. Pikmin 3, Super Mario 3D World, Minecraft, and maybe work on my second playthrough of Xenoblade. So, I would recommend, Brandon, take a nap, because it doesn't sound like you slept this weekend, uh, but those are all great choices. Really great choices. Although I never played a Pikmin game, either. I think I'm actually going to pick up Pikmin 3, just because it's a Nintendo game on a Nintendo system, which means it has to be good. Yeah. So, I think, I, I think I'm actually going to pick it up, because there aren't... I was thinking about it, and there aren't a ton of Wii U games that interest me right now. Uh, that's because you're dumb. Wind Waker HD. Yeah, I've, I'm going to pick that up as well. Also, a Nintendo game on a Nintendo system. Sure. So, uh, Danila or Danila is playing Metal MGR Revengeance. So it's Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. So I should probably stop calling it Metal Gear Solid Revengeance. It's a hell of a name. And then, and then this person said, "Pity you, casuals." <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a platinum game. So I'll talk about that next week. Uh, let's see. Kyle says I'm gonna stay in and probably play Minecraft. We have a, maybe we should play Minecraft. If half of our listeners are playing Minecraft, we should probably play Minecraft. I just don't think it's a thing for me at this point in my life. Like I don't have the creativity to take advantage of it. I just I know I don't. All right. Well, we'll see what our Minecraft fans say when we post this. But uh, I mean, it's isn't it free or really cheap? No, I think it's like thirty bucks. Oh, even on Steam? I I don't even know if it's on Steam. I think it's its own platform. 
I'm not even kidding you. I think it's its own thing. We're I think so Mine- bad at this. Minecraft We're... is taking over the world. Minecraft teaches your kids Spanish and how to overthrow governments. Did you hear somebody built a 3D printer on my- in Minecraft? Yes, I did hear that. Okay. So, so see, listener, we know what happens cursory related to Minecraft, just not all about it. Wait a minute. If you rearrange the letters of Minecraft and you add a Y and a K, it does spell Skynet. Plus a couple of other extra letters. We just have to add those other letters, and then you have to drop off. It's cl- it's close enough, I would say. John Connor. So our fan, our fan Callum, was uh, is says I'm playing Skyrim again for the third time. No Jake Hayes or jokes. Skyrim, more Elder Scrolls. I, yeah, I I gotta. I'll play him eventually, but I, I don't like spending. Uh, I don't know. It's a long game. I say that, but I want to get Nino Kuni, which is like ninety hours, right? Oh, it's so good though. I know. There's too. There's too many. There's too many games right now. Like this is this is an, this is insane. I'm still not used to being an adult with literally too many video games at my disposal to play. And my problem is that I'm non-committal, and that makes it hard for me to actually commit to even playing one. That is the definition of non-committal. Right. So the fact that I have like eight that I really want to play, I mean, I, I want to keep playing Revengeance. It's been fun so far. I want to play more 3D World, but I, I'd like to play it with people. I want to play these other games. I, I got Guacamelee I was very excited about. I've heard really good things. I want to play that. Ah, so much. Our friend Blake just sent me the links to, I just downloaded three Legend of Zelda Link to the Past uh, unofficial sequels that are actually flash based games, but you can play link to the past. They're like link to the past remakes. And apparently they're really fun. I don't know, John. I just don't know. It seems like a lot of work. What does all these video games? It's so much work. See what we do for you. Listener. we have fun for you. Now. Yeah, what? that's true. I hope you're, I hope you're appreciative. I'm also going to start writing reviews and putting them on our website unqualifiedgamers.com that sounds pretty qualified nope they're still gonna be pretty clueless they'll be the they'll be the like kind of mini snippet reviews for those who don't have you know an hour and a half to listen to us just write in incredibly broken english i think that would make them (laughs) superb explain to me how how that would help anything well frankly you're not gonna have to try that hard to do that all right my name for the for the love of f- John. My name is not Frank Lee. Frank Lee. Frank Lee is the name of the unlockable character in Double Dragon Seven: Revenge of the Shinobi. Revengeance. Revengeance. Yes. Also, not a real game. Although Revengeance does exist in the name of a game. Thank yes. you, Hideo Kojima. Metal Gear Solid Rising: The Phantom Revengeance. Solid Snake Eater. Part three, Revengeance. So, listener, we are happy that uh, that you joined us today. And again, you can find us now on Gunna Geek Networks. Um, so that's GunnaGeek.com. As- <laughs> you say Gunna funny. How are you spell Gunna? Gunna? But you, yeah, you kind of say it. Like, you kind of like Gunna Geek. You're like Gunna Geek. Is it, is it supposed to, what am I supposed to say? Gunna Geek? Do you, want me to, do you want me to enunciate better? Because I will. I'll not say it all over your face. No, say it so we know what you're saying. Be like, I'm going geek, yo. That's, that that is completely not clear. I'm going geek. You're listening that's, to the that's Gone better. Geek Network. Really, that's that's better. You're listening to the Gone Geek Network. That's yo, better. Boy. So you can find us on gunageek.com. You can also find us on unqualifiedgamers.com. Uh, you can leave us comments there. We're very active on Google+, which we're the unqualified gamers on Google+. You can send us messages that way. You can also email us. That email is on our G- on our uh, Google+, Plus page, as well as our web page. But if you want to hear it here, it's unqualifiedpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we do love to hear from you guys. Um, and we will get back to you if you, if you send us questions and email us, because... We really like to respond. Because John has nothing better to do. I have nothing better to do. He has literally no life. That's exactly right. I have nothing better to do than respond to you, listener. Yes. And he has a hard-on for iTunes reviews, so if you want to get in John's pants, write us an iTunes review. Cody's not wrong. I know. 
That's why I said it. Oh Sometimes I upload our episodes to YouTube as well, so you can find us there, but uh, no guarantees. It's hard to be everywhere, isn't it? It's hard to be everywhere. Yes. I think I think that's uh, a Phil Collins song. I am not familiar with that band. Phil Collins and the Revengeance Experience, right? And the t- it's Phil Collins and the Tarzans. Phil Collins and the Disney Tarzans? Phil, Phil- Collins and the Disney Tarzans Revengeance. Something like that. We forgot to talk about Star Wars. It's Star Wars is is a sci-fi fantasy story. They're making talk- a new wait. one. No. We also forgot to talk about the WWE network. I that was that was never on our list of things to talk about. That was on my list of things to talk about. It's never on our list of things to talk about. And Have you it heard will about never... the WWE network? I actually haven't. Wait, you didn't? No. Wait, I actually want to tell you about this really quick. Okay. Because you might be interested. I WWE... probably won't be, but okay. No, starting in February, they're going to offer a twenty-four-seven streaming service that also allows you to watch WWE owned content on demand. So they will have a 24-7 schedule of programming, including several original shows, like uh, there's some reality show where a bunch of old WWE legends live in a house together. It'll probably be stupid. But included in that package is you're able to live stream every pay-per-view throughout the year, included in the package, including WrestleMania, at no extra charge, and on-demand Every pay-per-view from WWE, WCW, and ECW. Holy s***. Ever. How how much is that? Ten bucks a month. Are you kidding me? No, I'm serious. It's like, they announced it, and it's, it is going to, it's, it's a big deal. I cannot believe that is ten bucks a month. All right, that actually is pretty impressive. No, I ten, know I, ten bucks a month. I posted on our friends on our friends' wall, and our friend Logan commented, and he was like, "Holy crap, I might get that." Because you're talking about all the classics, all the stuff that like you and I grew up with, like all of it. Now you have to sign a six month contract, apparently, so you have to pay for six months at a time. Um, but that's that seems to be the only catch so far. If only I had any interest in wrestling anymore. Right. Right. But for anyone with even a cursory interest in wrestling, 10 bucks a month to include every pay-per-view. And, like, cable companies are already getting pissed about it. Some have already pulled WWE from their pay-per-view schedule because they're like, well, fine, if you're not going to be, if you're going to, like, offer it for cheaper, we're not going to offer you on our cable service. So they wow. know they're getting backlash, but they're, it's, it's a huge risk, but it is, it is very forward-thinking because people are sick of cable packages, right? And paying fifty dollars for pay per views, and well, there's yes, the pay per view pricing model is terrible. But I mean, people are sick of paying a hundred bucks a month for ninety five percent garbage they never watch. Right, that's true. I mean, cable companies have a terrible reputation, so WWE is just like, let's just skip it. I mean, it's it's going to be like a Netflix for just wrestling, but they have enough content to where they can actually pull it off. Um, so it could be super interesting. We'll see. I'm excited. My guess is they're just going to run commercials on it. So they'll have advertising options for advertisers, and that's how they're going to make them money. But I think WWE is going to print money with this thing. It's it's really big. It certainly could, and nobody cares. Well, sometimes nerds like wrestling, and so do geeks, and we're part of Gonna Geek, or as you call it, Gonna Geek. And uh, so maybe our listeners interested. So shut up, bunch of sweaty muscle dudes. Yeah, that's what I'm into. What are you gonna do about it? Nothing. You gonna know, f- my girlfriend? Don't have one. So. Stop.